sometimes. It is restlessness. Sometimes it's agitation. Sometimes it's sloth or torpor, laziness or drowsiness. Sometimes it's anger, a sense of resentment. or the feeling of wanting something badly. And sometimes it is doubt that seem to be with us when we're sitting or even when we're not sitting during the day and we can't seem to shake it off. We try to bring the mind back, we try to bring the mind back, we try to bring the mind back, but somehow it just can't be shaken off. It's there, it doesn't want to leave. That's an opportunity for us to practice patience. Patience with ourselves. Often we forget that before we have patience towards the world, towards others, there first needs to be patience towards ourselves. Patience towards the mind, patience towards the heart. Patience. As opposed to impatience. Lord Buddha highlights this as he points out how the highest virtue, in fact, is patience. I mean, even higher than wisdom? Yes. Because without patience, we have no wisdom, no chance of ever experiencing wisdom or making room in the heart, in the mind for wisdom to take place. Without patience, there cannot be Nibbana. The Arya Savakas, the Arahants, speak of the cooling effect of Nibbana. They say it's cool, refreshingly cool. And when you look at impatience, you see how it is burning, it is hot, it is boiling, it is agitated, it is unsettled. And we try to fix it. And we throw all kinds of techniques that we've come up with or learned or studied. We give it a little bit of this sutta or a little bit of that teaching, a little bit of seven factors of awakening, but it is not willing to budge. Whether it's the doubt, meaning we cannot inculcate in us that faith, which is so important, the sadha. Because sometimes we fall into like this 
if you've traveled ever on a plane, sometimes we get to these air pockets, turbulence they call it. Suddenly the plane just drops. So from one day to the next, even from the same day, even within the same city, sometimes the mind will do its thing. Sometimes we will experience certain phenomena, unpleasant phenomena, such as, well, where did that tranquility go? Why did it go? Let me bring it back. Where did this drowsiness come from? And sometimes we have no logical explanation, but these things are there. Well, it's the same thing with the body. Suddenly there's an ache and pain, or even when you're not exercising or you have taken care of your body, suddenly there's pains and, and, and diseases infesting the body. Again, we get moving with, okay, I have to fix this. So the desire or the longing to fix this, fix the situation, get rid of this, because I want that which is good. I want that which is better than this. That is impatience. So long as we have that, Nibbana cannot happen. Now, well, does that mean that we're just going to sit in the, in the, in the, in the mire and just like, okay, so I guess we have to sit with this and stop trying, stop doing the work? No. If I were to offer a, a, a metaphor or a simile rather, as Lord Buddha and the Arya Savakas say in the suttas, for some wise people can grasp the meaning through the usage of similes. So imagine a thread or a string that you need to slide it through the eye of a needle. My grandmother used to have several because her eyesight was pretty bad. And she would, whenever she saw me not playing with my toys and things, she would call me over and say, put these strings inside these, you know, the eyes of the needle, please. So she had several ready lined up for different color strings and things. And then I would try initially because I'm so impatient. I have to do this and go back to my matchbox, you know, die cast cars I wanted to play. And it would get annoying because I would also so-called ruin the, the edge of the string or the thread. And then she would show me how to do it. She would moisten it with her lips and then she would just hold it so steadily and then slide it through the eye of the needle. Initially, it might be very deliberate movement, even fast. But then when you get close to the eye of the needle, you have to really, really be cognizant of what you're doing and patient. Sometimes when you're in a very demanding program, let's say in academia, or finishing a major project in your professional work, 
and you have done all the massive work already, but you're right there at the tail end of it. And then the heart starts fluttering. The heart starts to, oh, I'm so excited. I can't, oh, I hope nothing screws this up. I hope I don't screw this up. Oh, maybe something will happen to screw this up. <sighs> that is you right there passing the string at, through the eye of the needle. Patience is necessary because impatience is agitated energy, a state of mind that is hot. And it's loaded with ignorance. Patience has room for wisdom. It can make room for wisdom to happen, to come into the scene. Once Venerable Sariputta had a student, a novice, young, young novice monk. And that day they were going on Pindapada, on, on alms round, and then the time was right for this young novice monk to penetrate with insight. And Venerable Sariputta so lovingly worked, worked with him, telling him, guiding him, instructing him, inspiring him, encouraging him, just to get the alignment proper to get it right and he encourages him to basically forego forget about food that day <laughs> because it was so right he was going deep and he was going deep very quickly to such a point where he sees the Dhamma, he has the eye, of, he becomes a Sotapanna, Sakadagami, and he becomes an Anagami. Venerable Sariputta says, go, go to your Kuti. In fact, go to my Kuti, I think. Go there, forget about everything else. I'll even bring you food. Just, just go and sit. And he goes to the monastery and it was empty of the bhikkhus because they had all gone to alms room. And the monk sits in Venerable Sariputta's kuti. I think it was Venerable Sariputta's. And he sits to meditate. And it becomes so quiet. Even the devas come in and hush up the birds all the noise, the rustling sound of the leaves, everything gets quiet, still. Creating that atmosphere of patience, of allowance, of permitting whatever is to come to come. And it's lovely because after the midday, they even say how the devas had to extend the sun didn't move because even the devas were trying to make this young novice monk not be deprived of his food because he's exerting so much energy. And then Venerable Sariputta brings his alms bowl full of food to offer to this, to, to make sure that this young monk is, has eaten. At that moment, Lord Buddha steps in front of Venerable Sariputta knowing full well how the development of the young bhikkhu inside the door in the kuti was going in his meditation. And he engages in, in whispers with Sariputta, asks him some very simple mundane questions almost, simply to buy time so that the young monk over there can actually get it done. And then Lord Buddha smiles because the young monk indoors in behind that door does attain arahanship. And then Lord Buddha steps out of the way and says, go ahead. 
to Sari Pitta. It's a beautiful scene. To me, it captures the whole mood of patience, of allowing. Oftentimes when we're sitting or dealing with life, we're so agitated, especially nowadays, of course. On top of that, we want to make sure that the citadel or the this, this world that we live in or inside, the mind is protected. At least we want to make sure that there's calmness and tranquility there. But how do we go about doing that, making sure that that is the case? We start fighting, we start pushing, we start wanting silence. We, we start wanting tranquility badly. Well, that is missing the point because now we have again introduced ignorance in the guise of wanting to have fasadi or even samadhi happen. But that's why it's so essential for us to use discernment to go back and look at the the bottom. What what is this? Is this is this a cover up? Is this some type of a deception? Usually it is. When there's impatience involved, that's what it is. Even though on the surface it looks very lofty, it's, it's come on. I mean, how could wanting tranquility be bad? It cannot be bad. But so long as the agitation is going on, it's adding, adding, adding. So long as the, bo the blood is boiling underneath, there's more restlessness being introduced. So I'm fanning the flames of desire. Last week, I was mentioning how important it is for us to look at the enthusiasm, which is like the root behind every single state that we have, we experience, we undergo. The enthusiasm, which brings forth the body of the tree, which is Manasikara, which is Yoniso Manasikara, needs to be. However, which is attention, by the way. But what we leave it or turn it into is Ayoniso Manasikara, which is wrongly placed attention. That brings about suffering. Impatience is suffering. Burning is suffering, as we saw last week in the sutta. That's when the person, with all good intents, you know, in, uh, you know, good intention, can be creating more suffering for oneself, even though initially the intention had been to get rid of suffering. And this is when we are not practicing wisdom. Wisdom is the thing which allows us to see whether there is the patience or not, whether I do have a forgiving attitude. And that's another, uh, could be another definition for patience. Do I have a forgiving attitude towards myself? Towards the fact that yes, yes, in spite of all my efforts, I am not able to maintain sati. But I'm bringing it back the moment I realize, the moment I'm looking and seeing, oh, there's Dhamma Vichaya now putting the shed light, shedding light, the spotlight on the fact that I have been drowsy or at, you know, not on my meditation object for the last 17 minutes or hour. See it drop that attitude of quickly going back to remorse. No, let's drop that immediately and come back. It's okay. I've said many times that we don't have mantras, but you can use terms that can help you in your practice. So it's okay it can be such a tool, a valuable tool when it is being done with responsibility and compassion and understanding. 
And then we start to create more and more of these pockets of or oases for us to rely on so that the practice can really, really thrive. Because our goal is not to maintain or get to a state of absolute complete tranquility all the time. That's not natural. The mind cannot be in that state all the time. Because that's not going to bring wisdom. This is an insight based. This is a wisdom based practice. It requires discernment through and through. There were meditators who were reaching that state, you know, seventh jhana, eighth jhana in India at the time. But they were completely lost in defilements, in ignorance. So we use the tranquility wisely to create the space for insights to take place, for understanding of this whole mechanism, just seeing that, oh, oh, I see, I have been impatient with myself. Well, that tells me why I get so irritated later on. When I'm out of a jhana, for example, and I'm encountering you and I'm seeing you doing something and I get angry, I yell at you, scold you, insult you. And then feel bad about it. That pretty much explains the dilemma that many students have had encountering a certain teacher who is all, who's very holy on the outside. But then there's this other thing which you cannot wrap your mind around. It's a dichotomy. It's like, uh, this is not supposed to happen, but it is. You never had that with the Arya Savakas. You never had that with Lord Buddha. Why? Because the mind was on it. It meaning whatever was taking place. And that is where the attention has to be. Mindfulness has to be, because we don't know what might show up, what might happen, just like in the case of the body. When those piercing, pinching sensations were coming into Lord Buddha's bodily sensation when he was giving the Dhamma talk, for example, suddenly he was attacked by severe physical pain, his, his back. Or when Venerable Sariputta had severe headaches or, or spe especially dysentery, where he was releasing so much blood every time he went to the bathroom, which is very, very painful. It's not always, you know, what's, what is about to happen before it happens. Sometimes it happens without you knowing about it, but you know it immediately when it does happen. Why? Because the mind is there, but you don't lock on to that experience. You don't just crystallize that sensation as it comes in. And this ties in with what we were talking about last week in the Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, all things are burning from the Sangita Nikaya. Meaning we don't lock on, we don't, lean into, we don't grab that experience, that feeling. This is a bad feeling. How come I'm having this bad feeling again? Let me fight it. Let me try to calm down. Let me, again, there is a you and an I relationship, object and subject relationship. There's a give and take relationship. There's an identification basically. And that is dangerous. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to go to the other extreme and just completely deny that it is happening. No. But we don't identify with that. How? We see what is taking place. And we quickly jump back to the mind. Meaning, what is my attitude? 
okay, I'm now more interested in if there's any agitation in the mind. The more we do this, the more we get the knack of things. You know, we, we become more proficient at not being slipped into the experience of whether it is pleasant, pleasurable basically, whether it is, it is painful or whether it is neutral, meaning we're completely oblivious that it is happening, diluted by the experience. So when the experience comes knocking on any of the six sense doors, the most powerful, the most authoritative sense organ always will happen to be the mind. You can, after all, close the eyes and you stop seeing what you were seeing, whether good, bad, ugly, whatever. But your mind is going to still work on it. Mano Vinyana. Sanya is going to come up. Perceptions, images, memories, associations, because of what we saw. That's why the mind is a lot more dangerous when it is not doing its job as it's supposed to, which is observing the mind itself. Next week, we will cover anapanasati, the uh, in and out breathing, contemplation, meditation. And I don't even know if we're going to be able to finish it in one session, but there, there the Lord Buddha breaks it beautifully down into seeing the mind, experiencing the mind, he says. As you're breathing in, as you're breathing out, experiencing the mind, which is Chittanapasana, which is part of the Satipatthana, of course, the third. When we are practicing observation of the mind, we are seeing whether the mind is impatient or patient. We are seeing if there is resentment or if there is acceptance. We are seeing if we are leaning into this object, into this sensation that I'm, I just picked up. Or even, especially, the thought, this antagonistic thought that I just don't want to see. Some images that showed up out of nowhere, maybe from my past, in this life or from other pasts that I don't even identify, but it is troublesome, it is uncomfortable. So instead of playing, you know, going into a boxing ring with that, trying to knock it out, leave the ring, leave the boxing ring. That's not our place. It can never be allowed basically in the mind of an arahant to engage in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with whatever the thing is causing, causing us to experience. That's child's play almost, you know, the mind of an arahant would consider. Why? Because the most important thing is, oh, oh, so there is anger here. Ah, I see. Okay, let's let's look at that. And as we are looking, this is where it gets interesting, and we start seeing the characteristics of existence play beautifully. This is where we start seeing how that hot, very boily, very intense feeling, whether it was pleasurable, painful, or not. Suddenly, it isn't so hot as it was when it first started, when we first noticed it. So there was a beginning. Ah, yes, there was a beginning. Okay. So the attention is on that. And that's why Lord Buddha insists on the, us not identifying, just like he said to Bahia. 
When seeing, just see, just see. Don't get involved. That's not your job. Oh, look how pretty. Look at the features. Oh, look at the, yes, let me write a poetry. Yes, oh, yes, I remember. No, no, no. Waste the time. That's the path of a putujana. Nothing to do with the path of Lord Buddha. So when it happened, the pleasurable experience, let's say, it was so hot. It was so juicy. It was so fresh. It was so perfect, plump. But uh, it starts to wither. So it has a beginning and it has a middle and all of a sudden it's gone. But there's another one coming in. And it's gone. And there's another one coming. Of course, I am slowing it down. Probably <laughs> by a million times over. But as we pay close attention to this mechanism, to this operation, we start seeing the magic trick. We start seeing Maya, as they say, the illusion taking place in front of our eyes. And then we start to see, because we have created some space between ourselves, the awareness, and the experience of it, the feeling, the object. So we don't add stories. Well, he didn't have to step on my foot. Yeah, look how it, my toe is now bruised up. That's the story. That's content, totally, totally unimportant as far as this work is concerned. Next time, don't put yourself in a position like that. And if you didn't and still it happened, learn from it. Learn from it because that is not the objective. The objective of mindfulness is to observe the mind as we are developing a position a counter position to this experience. And that is what needs to be in focus. The magnifying glass has to be on that because that is the thing which leads us, leads us into Pono Bhavika, which means do the desire to be reborn either into the next moment or into the next life, by the way. If you ask a person who's dying, who's not awake, who's not, who's never had the experience of Dhamma, 99.9% .9 of the time, if not 100% of the time, they're going to say, let me get a do-over. Let me do this again, but I'll, I'll change this again. I'll, I'll, I'll tweak it. I'll make it right. Of course, they won't use those words they will use this fervent desire for re-becoming. That's the craving that leads one from one life to the next. They have not finished their job. Why? Because the six sense doors are so juicy for the mind. And anyone from the lowest of hell realms up to the highest of Brahma realms We are stuck in that. In the we are play things, we are toys, basically, in the hands of these six senses. And this creates a lot of agitation. So my encouragement today in this in sharing of this Dhamma with you is to encourage you to look at your own attitude in relation to how you do your meditation, how you're involved in the, your practice, in your own practice, to tweak it, to fix the parts of it that is just a carryover from how you live your life already. Meaning if you find something uncomfortable, you try to get to fix it, to change things. That is what I'm referring to as developing this combative 
impatient attitude in your practice. Because so long as we have that, Nibbana cannot happen. Even if you've had one or two jhanas or something like that, And we're not going after the cookies either. The cookies are basically things or attainments or this or that, or even the jhanas, or, or even that nice tranquil state. The tranquil state has a purpose, and it is to familiarize us with the state of openness and patience to allow for wisdom to still be carried over from one place to the next. There was once in India, a famous Maharaja who was also, who means Maha means great, Raja means king. So uh, who was obviously very wealthy, but he was unique in that he was also very wise. And at that time, there was a young, young boy born who was a project, prodigy, basically. He, especially he had learned the Vedas. He was very knowledgeable and about uh, uh, the sacred texts of that culture. So he goes from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher and he masters their techniques. And then they say, well, uh, you need to now go to the greatest. Uh, and that is this Maharaja. So they take the child to him. And uh, meanwhile, the Maharaja is very busy. Apparently, he's entertaining em ambassadors or, you know, other leaders. And he says, okay, you're the child. Okay, come over here, he says. He gives him a golden uh, spoon. And he pours some oil into the spoon. And he says, don't spill it, hold it. And he calls his chief of staff and he says, take him to all the rooms in my palace. And he says to the boy, don't spill it as you're walking around my palace. Take him from room to room, from chamber to chamber. And he says, yes, sire, and he takes him. At the end of the day, the boy comes with the spoon holding his, his, his spoon like this and so careful, he's not even paying attention to the Maharaja. And the Maharaja says, oh, you came back. And he, he looks at the spoon, he's like, oh, good. It's mostly there. He says, yes, yes, I didn't spill anything. And he says, what about the paintings on the walls? Did you see them? Did you see the crystals? Did you see the diamond crusted gold covered? All? He says, no, I didn't see. He says, ah, oh, you failed. He says, oh, please, please give me another chance. And then he says, okay, come back tomorrow. He comes back tomorrow, the next, the next day. Again, the same routine. And this time the child goes and comes back at the end of the day. And he says, oh, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. And this was this, and it was beautiful here, this and that, the tiger skin and high. He says, ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. But look down to your spoon, he says, it's empty. You spilled it. He says, oh, please, please give me another chance. He says, okay. So he comes back the next day and again with the same routine and he goes around the palace and comes back holding the spoon intact with the oil still in it. And he recounts what he had seen. That is the way I understand applying patience and wisdom together as we are practicing to see where the chanda is, meaning the fervency, the enthusiasm in why we are attentive on this. So if I am being impatient, then it means I am wrongly placing my attention, meaning it is on the wrong thing, my attention. But why? Because if my attention is going somewhere, it means that I have the excitement, I have the enthusiasm for that thing. Maybe it is me wanting to get rid of this agitation, or maybe it is 
to attain something. But the attaining of something is not the attainment of Nibbana. That's why often the Arya Savakas and Lord Buddha always talks about the deathless, deathless, or animitta also. Animitta means the signless, signless. Animitta cheto vimutti, the signless release of the heart, which is Nibbana, by the way. So you're not going to write to anyone saying, oh, I attained Nibbana. Oh, I'm an Arahat now. Oh, I'm an Anagami now. Yes, yeah. look at me. I have a business card. I am a Sotapanna. No, none of that. That is the wrong Chanda. That is the wrong attitude. And that definitely means that that person is, has got nothing to do with Nibbana. They never experienced any of it. Not even a Sotapanna. It's just delusion. They're just a charlatan. To themselves and to others. Plain and simple. So we need to bring our attention back to Chanda, which is the desire, if you will, or the enthusiasm. From where comes the energy to put the attention onto something? So the attention and the Chanda or Manasikara and Chanda are very much hand in hand. They work together. So if I am focusing on saying self-disparaging things, if I am feeling uh, upset, resentful, angry, whatever the case may be, that means that that is where the attention is going. And Every experience that will happen based off of that will be a reflection of this, which also is going to be, which is the attention part, manasikara. And whatever the attention is on also says where it started from, the root, the chanda, meaning the enthusiasm is on the wrong thing. So we have to first fix that. That's why I encourage you every time you sit, check your attitude. What is your excitement about? What is your enthusiasm? Why are you sitting? To understand is a good answer. To not no longer be agitated with this fighting back and forth. To understand what is it that I feel forced to go into my senses and identify with them and hold on to them and fight with them. Why? That why is a good attitude. And then we start using the various different formulas that Lord Buddha gave, whether it's the seven factors of awakening, whether it is even the four noble truths, whether it is the, the five spiritual faculties, how is my faith, sadha? How is my energy, virya? How is my sati? How is my mindfulness? How is my samadhi? Okay, and how is my wisdom? Whichever formula we use, if we use it with the right intention, again, we go back to the chanda, then it's all going to be wonderful because you're starting with the, on the right foot, as they say, with the right foot on this journey. So there is a sutta where Venerable Anuruddha, who was known for his psychic ability as far as the divine eye, Dibba Chakku, and he would see 100,000 galaxies. He would see what's happening where, he would hear conversations of devas. He would see the deepest parts of hell. He would see the Brahma gods in all their full glory. So that definitely makes a person feel somewhat conceited if they are not Arahants. And he was, at least to himself. 
How do we know this? Because he was such a humble, humble bhikkhu as well. So how could he have those both? Because there was an encounter that happens, and we see this in the suttas, uh, where he goes to Venerable Sarikutta, and he, you can tell he is perplexed. He is upset. He is agitated. He is impatient. He goes to Venerable Sariputta and says, Abuso, friend, Sariputta, even though I'm able to see 10,000, 100,000 different galaxies, star systems, I'm able to see the gods and this and that, but, he says, and, and by the way, even though I'm able to hold a deep level of concentration for a long period of time, even though, even though, even though, I am still feeling like I'm not even close to attaining arahantship. And Venerable Sariputta, in his beautiful, beautiful, uh, compassionate and patient way, says, friend, your ability to see cosmos and things like that is your conceit. Your, um, I think he says about his meditation uh, ability to stay in samadhi for a long time. He says, that is your uh, uh, restlessness, he says. And then he says, the thought that you have yet to attain arahanship, that is your fear. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing here. He says, instead of all being occupied by all these three, he says, just drop it, just forget about it. Just, just leave these things and just focus on one thing. He says, direct the mind towards the amata dhatu, which is the deathless element. Forget about all that. Because Venerable Sariputta did not have Dibba Chakku. He didn't, you know, he wasn't known as the person with psychic powers. He didn't have those. And he didn't care. What he had was the wisdom to see through all nonsense, including the nonsense of a conceit towards some type of an ability. Who cares? You can see what Brahma gods are doing. Who cares? Why would you even want to see it? Or listen to someone's someone's conversation, you know, three galaxies away from here. Who cares? You're going to die empty-handed, basically. And the conversation, the message, the teaching that Venerable Sariputta gave to Venerable Anuruddha was so impactful, so powerful, so moving, that he takes it. And he goes off and he practices consistently, day and night, the Satipatthana. In fact, when we did the Madhupindika Sutta some months ago, or the Honeyball Discourse, uh, we also, I think, we covered uh, a portion of the story of Venerable Anuruddha as he was almost there. <laughs> when Lord Buddha visits him, when he's having the great thoughts, the thoughts of a great man, it's uh, um, Mahavitaka, um, Mahapurisa Vitaka, I think it was. Anyhow, it's, it's the, the thoughts of a great man. And, and uh, in it, Venerable Anuruddha lists all the seven things that this path is for, a person of, of such a caliber, basically. This path is for someone who likes seclusion, to seclude oneself, at least every once in a while for, for, uh, for the lady. You need that sustenance. This is for someone who does not want too many things, he says. So he had all these seven listed, but he didn't have number eight. And Lord Buddha comes in and he reads his mind from afar. He comes in and says, Anuruddha, these are wonderful, but you, need, you missed one. He says, yes, Bhante, what is it? Please instruct me. And he says, this path is for someone who does not have papanchas, nipapancha, the term. Papanchas means, 
identification with the story, whatever sensations are coming in, good, bad, this and that, we don't add our own flair, we don't get absorbed in the details. We don't make this into my experience. Instead, we see it for what it is, and we see it long before it turns into papancha, the story-making machine in the mind, which basically means the mind is totally without sati. And that is why sati has to be there with us, whether we are in the four postures or everything in between. When you're sitting on your toilet seat, okay? Can it get any more personal than that? When you're getting up, when you're putting on your shoes, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're cleaning your teeth, flossing them, where is your mind? Are you leaning into something? Are you still trying to mentally chew on some experience, some conversation you had at 10 a.m. in the morning and already it's 10 p.m.? What is happening? That what is happening with the mind is a good start, is a good chanda, if you will, good enthusiasm, which means automatically it will bring the second phase of it, which is manasikara. And now because it's in the right place, it doesn't have the choice to be on a wrong attention, it will be in the right meaning it will have, because the chanda or the enthusiasm started right, it ends up being yoniso manasikara, which is radical attentiveness or wise reflection. And because you are with those two, you're so solid, you're so protected, if you will, so that when you're that attentive and life comes and knocks on any of the six sense doors, you will see what it is. You will open the door and say, ah, it's a burning sensation on my hand. Oh, I just burned my finger as I was taking out the souffle out of the oven, for example. You feel the burn, but you don't beat yourself over it. You don't start fighting with it. You don't curse. You don't yell. You're seeing, you're feeling and then, most importantly, you're seeing the action that is taking place in the mind, how it saw the pain, and because it had a start. And then it's watching the pain as it's dissipating, by the way. So it started and it's going up. Oh, okay, the mind is there. It's no longer with, oh, my finger, I burned it. No. It saw it starting point ah okay and it's watching it okay now it's less it's half intense and then oh okay oh look 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 at this oh it's gone and another thing comes in oh it's the ears you're hearing the birds sing and then part of the brain goes oh yes that's the same kind of singing of a bird that i heard when i was in oh hold on hold on hold on it's a pleasurable experience isn't it yes it was a it was, yes as we do this, we become faster and faster at picking up. And then until we get to the point where we pick up at the moment that it begins, at the moment it knocks, there is that knock. And that is what we are working towards in enhancing and sharpening our mindfulness for. Because otherwise, normally, when a person has good meditation and good mindfulness practice, usually they will pick up when that object is about to die. So not at the starting point, not the middle, but they usually will go to the end, exit, vanishing point. And this really becomes uh, more apparent with the breath. And that is, uh, well, actually that's a good reason why um, uh, and yet another reason why uh, having the Anapanasati next week will be, I think, very helpful to your practice because we will um, we will go in depth into that. So, with that, I will pause now and and open for any questions and thoughts you might have uh, regarding the practice.
Yes, yes. Can you can you raise the volume up, please, Mirko? Um, I can try to speak a bit louder. Yes. Oh, yes. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you. Go ahead. So, first of all, thank you for the space and for your talk, Sadhu. Um, I have a question around Panya, and you said um, um, patience is a requisite for wisdom to arise. Um, what else um, does need to be in place for so that uh, wisdom can come to be? Hmm. Okay, can I, were you done with the question, Mirko? Yes, I'm done, yes. Oh. Um, I am reminded of Venerable Sariputta again, when um, a similar question is raised. And he says, uh, uh, <laughs> the voice of another, the voice of another person, meaning a Kalyanamitta specifically, and um, the way I see it, um, being access, you know, having access to the Kalyanamitta and what the voice is saying. <laughs> what the voice is saying. So, in that sense, you could understand the suttas, for example. Uh, again, I'm very bad with my memory, uh, so I paraphrase a lot. But the voice of another, to me, is so important. And what we give our attention to is very important. So when a person is overwhelmed by whatever's going on with them or whatever's going on with the world around them, that has everything to do with where the attention is being placed in their lives normally. That means when they go to sleep, when they go to bed, what are their th thoughts on? When they wake up, even more important, when they first open their eyes, what are the first thoughts that come to mind? So in addition to patience, one can easily say, sati has to be there. So there's a whole bag of things that need to be there. So it's not just patience, of course. Patience encapsulates so many things. Uh, but the voice of another, now when it comes from Venerable Sariputta, we have an idea when, what he means by voice of another. First of all, the, that another has to be wise or wiser than us, at least. Um, um, someone who speaks the Dhamma who can help us, guide us when we are overwhelmed by whatever it is, including and especially by our own restlessness, meaning our own impatience. Because we might have sat, we might have really attained some good states, fine, but that might have been in the past. Because so long as we are not arahants, there's still dust that's settling on the table there's still an I and a you. I'm still picking up and holding. I'm not giving up yet. We have that tendency of grasping. So, so long as that is there, the person is still a disciple. And to have access to someone who has the capacity to show us that, that's brilliant, that's wonderful. So in addition to patience, I would say that. Uh, and of course, uh, reading the suttas or listening to the suttas again and again and again and, and, and practicing in your own sitting. But while we're practicing, not to be so cruel, not to be so uh, mean, not to be so strict. Because I, like me, as I was like five or seven years old, I was passing the string through the eye of the needle for my grandmother, I would do it so fast that it would just go vroom, vroom, to the sides or I would crush the edge of the string and not be good until she would come and fix it. And just, so that impatience has to be carefully watched, which requires wisdom again. So these things are necessary because like 
you know, again, using a reference from my parents, they would say, you cannot wash both hands with one hand. You need both <laughs> to wash your hands. You can't wash both hands with one hand. So they need it, they're both needed. So if we use patience and wisdom, they go hand in hand. That's another way of uh, using play on words. How is this working for you, Miko? Is, is, is my... Perfect, thank you. It yeah. helps a lot. Yes. I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, any other thoughts? Some, uh, uh, some of you might have other things to offer. Please uh, feel free. The stories of, of the Arahants, the Arya Savakas, are so helpful. And um, because sometimes we start thinking that, well, that was another time, another era, another culture, another people, the brains were different. We can come up with all kinds of excuses. But that is just another form of identification. This time we're identifying myself as different than you over there in the pages of history. You're antiquated. Well, that's not fair for us at the very least because the Arahants are gone, their, their task is done. Let us make use of the lessons that we can still extract. That's why when I speak of Venerable Sariputta or any of the, any of the Arahants, Arayasavakas, they're not dead for me. During the week when I'm going through my struggles, they're there. I use them as, as my inspiration. As So Venerable Sariputta's statement is not just 2,600 years ago. It has to be brought into my mind, but if I'm not having sati, I wouldn't even know about that statement, let alone how to use it. Um, I think there are some who would like to ask questions or comments. Oh, I thought someone was trying to say something. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, this is, you know, as long as we're alive, we have a shot. And it's our shot and it's our responsibility. And it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to live your life with dignity, with integrity. Because if I am, as I was hinting at earlier, if I have impatience towards myself, it immediately manifests, reflects into the world. Now I have impatience towards the world. And the world, no matter how bad it can be, how unpredictable it can be, it cannot hold a candle next to how unpredictable this thing is. One's own life, one's own body, one's own brain, one's own tendencies. Because sankaras are gonna keep coming up and we don't know which lifetime they're coming from. And who cares? Our job is not to go into the ring with them again. For some reason it's showing up, for some reason, I'm getting sluggish or I'm getting drowsy. I'm tired of fighting or understanding why, why I need to look at my attitude towards it. Let me develop some patience at the very least. Okay, now we're onto something. Slowly, slowly, it's like a muscle when you're working with your biceps and you're lifting weights. When you can't lift 10 kilograms or 20 pounds or whatever, initially, you have to start with something lighter. Slowly, slowly, you develop bigger and bigger and bigger muscles. Now you can't, you can, you know, carry 50 kilograms. It's the same thing with our mindfulness or the capacity to accept ourselves, which is another definition I see for patience. Because I, we don't know how long of a life we have. Now we have the Dhamma. In such a rare, 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 rare opportunity for you to be a human being, you have the ability to process, to see, to think, to understand, to analyze, to practice the Dhamma. And the Dhamma especially is available now. 
So you have all these points coming together into this point of singularity. Wonderful opportunity. Who knows what next next life is going to be like? None, uh, not many of us take this to heart. Not many of us or enough of us look at this seriously. We still are like, yeah, I'm, I'm just like a teenager. I'm having fun. I'm having fun. Last year, I had individuals in different countries as I was traveling, having like debating with me <laughs> for, well, Bhante, I understand. I understand the Dhamma that you're trying to help me with this and that, but I still want to go ahead and sleep around. I still want to go ahead and drink. I still want to go ahead and have fun. I said, okay, go ahead, do that. But I don't know if the next time you turn around a street corner, something's going to happen or you're going to fall or you're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have this virus or this disease, something. You're not going to wake up. So it's no time to take things for granted. It's never a good time to take things for granted to begin with, but especially with our life on the line. And it's not a doom and gloom, but it is in many ways it is <laughs> because we don't know because the amount of nasty things we have done in the past, whether the four layers, the lower miserable realms are going to be waiting for us after this, unless the person is a Sotapanna at the very least. So that is my goal, to get you guys to become Sotapannas at the very least. That is what Lord Buddha taught. To get his bhikkhus, his, his disciples, lay, lay disciples to attain. And so many of the laity, lay disciples, male and female disciples were Sotapannas. Some were Sakadagamis, once returners, and some were also Anagamis. They could never drop anything lower than a human realm if they come back. These are not mythological stories because the person will know for oneself. They will know in their guts that that's it, that door is closed for me for good. They don't tell that to themselves. They don't have to convince themselves that yes, I am not gonna go to hell. They will know. It's like being in love, to use a mundane <laughs> metaphor. But you know, no one has to convince you. No one can convince you otherwise. So, but there needs to be that drive from the person. And that's why the intention to come back to the enthusiasm, the chanda part, the roots, and I love the image that Bhante Nyanananda uses. And that's where I'm referring to, by the way, by giving them the image of a root system for the chanda, which is the enthusiasm. And the tree uh, is the manasikara, the trunk, the branches, the, the foliage, the leaves. And then you have the fruits. That is the pasa. That is the contact portion, if you will, the feeling portion. Without contact, there cannot be feeling. But the feeling, what kind of feeling we experience has everything to do with where the attention is placed. And wherever the attention is placed is telling us where the enthusiasm is placed, the root system is. So if you plant a mango tree, you're not going to get bitter gourd. Okay, which is one of the most, you know, things that you can eat uh, for Westerners, at least. I've tried it a few, I really tried it, but it's like, oh, it's so bitter. It has medicinal qualities, but it's no mango, juicy mango. Why? Because its roots are for a bitter gourd. 
not for oranges, not for a juicy apple, not for grapes. So we always have to start with the root. What is the enthusiasm that I have towards? I just, do I just wanna waste time or do, do I just wanna have fun? Do my one hour sitting and go and have night clubbing and then drink and then do this and that. And then, no, I'm not breaking any presets. Okay, I'm not drinking that too. Okay, so I'm fine. Okay, but what is my attitude? Even in keeping the presets, do I wanna show off? Is there conceit? That already says that the person's enthusiasm is in the right place because they're identifying if there's conceit or not. They're asking the right questions, which means the attention is placed correctly. It is yoni somanasikara. That goes in addition to what uh, Venerable Sariputta was also saying there with the voice of another and having yoni somanasikara is crucial because the voice of another might be there, but my attention might be somewhere else. What good is there? So it's like somebody pouring water on the root system of a tree, which is thirsty, dry, but somebody had put plastic sheet over the soil. Or, uh, uh, you know, a big pot to collect the water in. And how is that water going to go to the roots? It's not. So it's wasted in a sense. So we need to have Yoni Somanasikara as well as the voice of another, paying attention to the suttas, being inspired, connecting with fellow Kalyana Mittas, but not for the sake of debating or enhancing our academic or intellectual conceptual understanding of Dhamma. That's not it because you have so many forums today online. It's mind boggling. Running from the rain only to get caught in the hailstorm, as my elders used to say. It's worse. Go be exposed, enjoy it, come back, practice, use it for as as fuel for your practice. Any other thoughts, comments before we close? Thanks very, uh, thanks very much for the talk, Bhante. Mm -hmm. um, it occurs to me that in the example of the little boy with the spoon full of oil, mm -hmm. we actually have the essence of sense restraint as taught by, uh, by the Buddha in the, the, in the Dhamma, isn't it? Um, we are told that um, when seeing, uh, sense restraint is not about not seeing, not hearing, not feeling, but rather um, when we see, we should be seeing without attending to the uh, attractive features, um, which, um, uh, which causes um, less aversion to occur. So, um, to me, it's like seeing um, without losing sight of the mind, mm -hmm. without spilling the oil internally. Mm -hmm. And um, that probably involves um, some very subtle internal multitasking of not losing the citta nimitta. Um, mm -hmm. Could you um, elaborate yeah. on that, please? Oh, yes. I love the, the image of the subtle internal uh, uh, multitasking you refer to. And that's what you guys are doing. Every time you sit to meditate, the mind comes in. You know, it's not like airtight compartments of just this hindrance from this moment. That, no, they come in. Usually they come with different gradients, a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And then you have to struggle with the body. The body says, I need to go to the restroom or I'm aching. Why are we sitting this long? All kinds of stuff. Meanwhile, you're constantly observing, doing a lot of multitasking. In that process, we become tight. In other words, impatient. And the jaws get clenched. Uh, the teeth start touching each other. 
The tongue gets tighter. The throat gets tighter. The fists get tighter. Maybe not so grossly, but they are tight. So as you become, your mindfulness becomes more and more subtle, you'll be able to see the subtle levels of that, those tensions. So similarly with what you were saying about the, um, the, the not being repelled, not being uh, like the aversive to it rather, to the negative or displeasing or painful features of this, Let's say somebody is giving you, <laughs> I'm laughing because this happened to me some time ago as a layman, uh, where you are meeting this head of the company and you and they have a disagreement on things. And you know that all their function is their, their oh, chanda, their, their enthusiasm, the thing that gets them excited is about money. Okay, and you, on the other hand, are talking about, well, I'm a therapist or I'm a this, I'm, we have to work with the people. So it's a relationship, we have to have compassion, we have to have this, so let me work with this many people, etc. Basically, they give you the, they fire you, for example. So this person becomes now the epitome of ugliness, of painful, because they represent everything anti of what you represent. Now, in that context, it's so easy for the mind to latch on to the signs and features, as Lord Buddha says, in this case, the ugly, the painful. It's so easy because this person just gave you the reasons. They told you you have about 30 days left. You have to find another job and you we don't agree with you because i care about the money coming in not how many people are going away happy and healthy because they came to see a therapist because it's a business for them for you it's a human endeavor of helping and transforming lives so the mind is like ah and anger starts creeping in aha signs and features Again, totally, totally identifying. Now, this could have been totally different. The person might be giving you a raise and say, I'm going to give you three times as much as you're making and do what you're doing best. So, oh my God, now I'm going to worship this person. Oh, how beautiful it is. The same face. The same person now becomes adorable. An angel. In either case, these are signs and features which we should not be involved. So long as our objective is to gain wisdom to, trans, to, to transcend them. Because ultimately, there's avarice, there's, there's aversion, there is, there is, there is hatred towards the unpleasant. And similarly, in, in, well, actually conversely, there is the liking, enjoying of the pleasurable, the opposite. So in both cases, we have what? We have conceit. In both cases, we have comparing and contrasting going on. This versus that. And it says in so many places in the suttas, so long as there is the this versus that, the mind is always going to be like this, agitated. There cannot be nibbana taking place, and this is creating basically. It's it it creates uh, uddacha, basically that restlessness, and it also creates remorse because it's not, you know, you you don't have hundred percent control of the mind. Whatever comes, it comes. So long as you have uh, 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 the five aggregates, the sankaras are going to come. There are these two states that they talk about, saupadisesa and anupadisesa, which means with residues remaining, meaning with the, with the khandas, aggregates remaining, and with the aggregates no more. To simplify, one is the anupadisesa, which is the aggregates are no more. 
And that is in reference to an arahant who is dead, who just breathed his last or her last, last breath. They're gone. No more aggregates to worry about, no more sankharas. Now the other arahant has to still deal with these aggregates. Now they are not subject to them, that's the thing. So when you hear, let's say, uh, uh, like in the case of Lord Buddha, you know, they say, you know, Mara came in, Mara's daughters came in, right? Uh, um, the, the, you know, trying to create lust and craving or raga or something like that. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that there were actual females, Mara's daughters who showed up. That's another reference, the way I understand it anyhow. It's a reference to the sankharas. They're going to come. Just like when you're sitting to meditate, they come up. You don't ask for them to show up many times. They show up. That's okay. That's where the patience has to come in for you to see because, and you would see these, but they don't have a table like the dust to settle on. The craving thought or whatever, it's not like Lord Buddha was craving, no. It's the old sankharas come in, the thought shows up. Again, it's not him thinking, it's just reverberations. It's like sometimes uh, you have forest fires miles and miles away. And then hundreds of miles away, you have ash, or it's like in case of a, a volcano. A thousand miles away, like it happened some years ago, 10 years ago in, in, in Iceland. Uh, Europe was covered with, with the ash of this volcano. What landed? The ash. So similarly, the momentum might have happened, started eons and eons ago, which is now showing up. So when it does occur, whether you are absent-minded without sati and you allowed there to be laziness, you weren't strongly there or something happened out of your control, it's irrelevant. What is relevant is your attitude. Can you hold on to that spoon while still with the corner of your eyes paying attention? That's why we must slow things down because that child was no longer walking around the hallways running with the spoon or looking carelessly because already he spilled it, but he's attentive. And when we are using the four postures in the Satipatthana, in, in the four foundations or establishments of mindfulness, when you are lying down in bed, when you wake up in the middle of your sleep, are you cognizant if you are lying on your left side or the right side? Are you on your back or are you on your tummy? And even more exciting is this. How is the mind at that moment? Even in your sleep. Now, of course, the teachers, the great teachers, the Arya Savakas, don't expect people to be mindful even while they're asleep. But Lord Buddha makes it very clear that as the person develops and develops and develops, their awareness, their mindfulness also seeps into the dream state. So it doesn't make a difference for them to be in and out of the sleep. It's like a person who goes into the pool and out of the pool. Is it the same person? Can the person be aware whether they're going into the pool and coming out of the pool? That is how it can turn into if the sati is strong enough. Because you're not caring about the texture of the water, because the moment you start caring about the texture, it's like a person who's mesmerized by the quality of the dream, being pulled into the dream, become one with these roles and these characters that show up. And it's a 
it's a vast uh, playground for the sankharas also, the dream or the sleep state. So, but essentially what we can have more control over is what I'm doing up until that moment until I fall asleep. And or when I get up, as I was mentioning to Mirko, when I wake up, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Am I on the breath? And this is where your aditana is extremely important, your determination, your willingness to be intentional. And it's like, no, I'm no nonsense. This is where I need to be strict with myself. For example, making the vow to yourself. I will not allow myself to wake up and have the first breath without mindfulness, period, Un inexcusable. I do not allow myself to wake up without the first breath being, the second breath, third breath, maybe, but the first breath, I'm not going to allow it. Play these games with yourself. See what happens. There's a wonderful thing that happens. Suddenly there is this ownership of your, oh, oh. The mind is still without you wanting to have it be still. It's like quiet. Where is everyone? Where are the sankaras? They're slowing down. They're like, this guy is he's like, we can't play with him. We keep coming up with things, but he's not playing with us. So what's the point? So the more you are able, and that's another thing we were talking about, patience. You're creating more of that space expansion, just like the Vihara, the Arama was, 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 uh, the monastery was so still when that young monk was sitting in the room meditating as he attained Arahanship. Quiet! You can hear Venerable Sariputta's footsteps coming close, and then you hear the other footsteps of Lord Buddha so serenely approach and block him. Because he knew that if Venerable Sariputta went and knocked on the door of that young monk, he might have missed an opportunity. And Lord Buddha knew he was so close. So we need to add more of that silence and more of that space. And that's another definition, I guess, for patience. To create that space for ourselves and if i have enough space for me to behave to act because something happened like i hit my toe against the wall accidentally instead of immediately response to stimuli kicks in let me observe ooh, ooh, ooh the sensations coming up i can feel it i can feel my temperature change my bodies because it's a painful experience the body just had a real experience we're not lying. We're not saying, no, 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 it's a pleasurable experience. No, it's, it's the toe is bruised now. We're seeing it. But what is the story I'm adding to it? So I hope that kind of gives a little bit more texture to what you were asking or <laughs> by not adding too much. <laughs> Pun intended. So I think this is this is good for today. Uh, and if you have any other further questions, please uh, don't shy away from sending me a, a message, and I will do my best in getting back to you uh, as soon as I can. So let us uh, share some merits. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Be well, practice, but with patience. 
may it not be just the theme for this week, but add them to the string of beads that is the list of practices that you do. But don't be so fixated on them. Have a playful attitude with yourself. Curious mind, light mind, uplifted mind, playful mind, but intentional mind that is also working towards wisdom, seeking wisdom. So be well. And next week we will have the, I already translated it and it's already, yeah, I, I recorded it. It's on YouTube, the Anapanasati. Um, I have two there. So this is the new version. The other one was three years ago. So I don't like that one, but I kept it nevertheless. So we'll cover that, um, the Anapanasati, and uh, it's a vast sutta. So probably we'll have to do it maybe in more than one session, but we'll see how, how, how it goes. All right, take care and I'll see you next week. Be well.